clearly, financial markets are an important part of the U.S. economy. Uh, they serve to provide many essential economic functions, channeling funds from savers to investors, allocating that capital as efficiently as possible, pricing risk and, and return, allowing individuals to diversify away from risk as they desire, and, and the list goes on. And in looking at those uh, financial markets, you'd like to have uh, all sorts of business models compete to, to uh, provide those services to, to the economy. And we have insurance companies and banks and uh, all sorts of things, including private equity. Um, my concern today is about the proposed legislation, and I'm concerned not because I'm a big fan of private equity. I'm not. I also have no particular animus toward private equity. I'm concerned because the legislation would tilt the legal, regulatory, and tax playing field quite strongly against private equity. And I think that the objective uh, of policy should be have that those uh, legal, regulatory, and tax policies be as neutral as possible. Uh, this is clearly uh, an attempt to, to tilt the playing field against private equity. And if there are uh, um, now, you know, sort of problems with the private equity, I think those should be dealt with uh, in other ways, um, identifying the harms and, and, and correcting the behaviors. So um, its success uh, in finding undervalued companies, uh, reforming their, their operations, um, uh, has delivered an enormous uh, footprint, right? There are, there are 11.7 million workers uh, in private equity earning about uh, $900 billion in compensation. Uh, these are good-paying jobs. The average employee is getting $73,000 in 2020. And the private uh, equity sector has uh, produced $1.4 trillion in, in gross domestic product, about 6.5% of GDP. That footprint is a testament to the success it has had in providing valuable economic functions. Uh, the flip side is that uh, this uh, legislation would, would undo that, and that would come at a tremendous cost. The Chamber of Commerce... Uh, estimates that the loss would, would range from somewhere between 6.9 to 26.3 million jobs in the U.S. economy and, and returns that are up to $3.5 billion a year for investors. And so uh, my hope is that uh, the discussion uh, can focus on what is good policy for private equity and others and uh, where there are, in fact, uh, identifiable harms to find remedies that aren't so sweeping as to disrupt the level playing field from a policy perspective. Thank you. I'm going to turn the gavel back over to our one. <laughs> it's a yes. story of my life. Mm -hmm. um, so we're next. I thought I would leave the virtuals to the end, but I shouldn't have done that. Okay. Uh, That's okay. The treasurer's next. So it looks like we have the Illinois State Treasurer next, the Honorable Michael Frerichs. Michael, are you there? I Mr. am. Can you hear me? Thank you. Yes, we can. Great. Well, good afternoon, Madam Chair and Ranking Member Kennedy, members of the subcommittee, and distinguished guests. Now, the clock I am looking at shows me a minute and 30 seconds. I no. I, there we go. <laughs> you, there you go. My name is Michael Ferricks. I'm the Illinois State Treasurer, elected by the great people of the state of Illinois. And as Senator Kennedy knows from his time as State Treasurer and my colleague in the National Association of State Treasurers, it is truly an honor to be entrusted with the people's money. It is an honor to be invited to speak with this subcommittee today. The Illinois State Treasurer performs many roles. I'm the state's chief investment and banking officer. In that role, my team and I actually manage approximately $50 billion. This portfolio includes roughly $25 billion in state funds, $16 billion in retirement and college savings plans, and $9 billion on behalf of local and state governments. Among those investments, or $500 million in private equity and venture capital. But I also serve as a trustee on the Illinois State Board of Investment, which manages approximately $31 billion in pension assets on behalf of over 226,000 beneficiaries. ISBE maintains approximately $1.7 billion of private equity investments. My job is to prudently invest public funds and pension funds, a portion of which are managed by private equity firms. I also have a responsibility to the long-term fiscal health of our state and local government institutions, which rely on a vibrant and sustainable economy. And I also have a duty to tend to the well-being of the communities I represent, including the economic security and dignity of millions of workers. Unfortunately, some private equity firms engage in practices that harm these objectives. 
From my experience as an institutional investor, there are several important challenges relating to private equity investments. In particular, the need for increased transparency and the need for reforms to ensure that workers, communities, and investors are protected from predatory practices. Before I go into further detail, I want to say that private equity is an essential part of our capitalist system. The idea of the industry is simple. Sometimes a company has room to grow and become more productive, but its current ownership is not in a position to capitalize on that opportunity. In this situation, it makes sense for an investment vehicle run by experts to provide to pool private capital to buy the firm and take it to the next level and then to sell it. This generates a profit for private equity firms and their investors. It helps the company to grow and it creates more economic opportunity for society at large. For investors like the Illinois Treasury, private equity provides an opportunity to further diversify our portfolios, to help drive economic development, to support small businesses, to expand the circle of opportunity to underutilize investment firms like those from downstate Illinois or those that are minority and women owned, and to provide a competitive return within our overall portfolio. Unfortunately, as private equity has continued to evolve and become a larger and larger portion of the economy, it has continued to be regulated as though it was a boutique investment that only affected the ultra wealthy. That means that predatory activities like opaque fees and pillaging assets and strategically using bankruptcy without regard for the well-being of workers and their communities and their pensions remains perfectly legal. And as long as these practices are allowed, they will happen. And as long as they happen, our communities are at risk. And that's why sensible reforms are needed to rein in harmful behavior by bad actors in the space. Let me talk uh, for a little bit about fee transparency before I run out of time. There has been a significant increase in demand from public pensions to invest in private equity. It's no wonder the asset class has had historic levels of fundraising and record amounts of distributions to investors. Private equity is unique and it is rooted in a sense of long-term partnership where investments are designed to mature in 10 to 15 years, if not longer. Fiduciary duty is the foundation of an effective partnership between general partners and limited partners in private equity funds. And this is especially important given that these investments are illiquid and currently require less transparency than other investment vehicles. And that brings me to a crucial point. There is a dire need for increased transparency and disclosure to help provide investors the necessary information to make informed decisions, including data on fees, in a clear, complete, consistent, and not misleading manner so that institutional investors like myself can better fulfill our fiduciary duties. I see my five minutes is coming to an end, uh, so I look forward to any questions you might have. So thank you very much, Mr. Treasurer. Appreciate uh, your comments here today. Uh, and next, we have joining us virtually Ms. Shirley Smith, who is a former employee of Art Van Furniture in Detroit, Michigan, and who is also a leader with United for Respect. Uh, Ms. Smith, I'd like to recognize you for five minutes, please. Thank you, Senators. Thank you so much for having me here. My name is Shirley Smith and I live in Detroit, Michigan. For 23 years, I worked for Art Van Furniture, the last nine as a sales manager. It was a job that I truly loved. Art Van was a family owned business and the company culture was centered around family. Employees were tight knit. We had each other's backs and there was real sense of community. It was, I was a single mom and I'm grateful for the support and flexibility I had at work so I could be there for my son while juggling a successful career. I had the opportunity to build relationships with my customers and earn a good living, making it possible to buy my own home and provide a good education for my son. Working at Art Van was like my own little slice of the American dream until the private equity firm, T.H. Lee, came in and broke up our family. Before T.H. Lee took over in 2017, Art Van was a successful company reporting $800 million in revenue that year. Up to then, most of my colleagues would have told you it was a company they loved working for. 
But those last three years were hell. It wasn't obvious right away, but a lot started changing. We noticed our top company leaders being pushed out the door. TH Lee brought in people who didn't even know the furniture business and orders started coming in slower. In hindsight, that was a big red flag. Sales associates work on straight commission, which only gets paid when the order is delivered and customers' orders weren't being filled. Art Band's reputation was being destroyed right before our eyes. We had to start making up excuses to our customers, some of whom grew violent when they learned they wouldn't be getting refunds. One of my, one of my colleagues even had a gun pulled on her during closing weekend. TH Lee made us feel like liars and thieves, taking people's hard on money when they knew they were never going to get their orders. We stopped paying our bills on time and started cutting staff for decades. Our van had been a debt-free company that paid all its bills. Under TH Lee's ownership, our van racked up millions of dollars in debt to Wall Street banks and other deep-pocketed creditors. TH Lee even sold off Art Van's real estate for itself, <clears throat> to itself, forcing Art Van to pay rent on the same properties it once owned. By the end of 2019, under TH Lee's so-called leadership, Art Van was in the red, and it took just three short years for TH Lee to strip our company for parts. Then the pandemic hit. We first received Warren Act notices about our layoffs before the COVID-19 emergency order was issued in Michigan. So the bankruptcy and layoffs had nothing to do with the pandemic. But then a few weeks later, our band changed their original Warren Act notice, citing COVID-19 instead. As a result, we didn't get any severance pay or benefits, nothing. Robbing the American workforce like this, hurting the same people on the front line who've been applauded as heroes for keeping our economy open should be a crime. When we were told <clears throat> we'd be losing our jobs, we were promised a lot. We were promised health insurance after closing. We never got it. The only insurance I could afford charged me 10 times what I've been paying for prescriptions. I was unemployed for five months and many times I had to choose between paying for my medications or paying other bills. We were also prom uh, promised a retention bonus that we never got. Since my employment didn't kick in for two months, I had to take money out of my 401 to make ends meet, which I'm still paying taxes on today. Sadly, my story is not unique. Private equity has quietly taken over nearly every facet of life, from retail and grocery store chains to housing, healthcare, media, and more, turning the American dream into nothing more than a pipe dream for millions of working families. And TH Lee didn't only destroy us, the individual workers who lost their job. Every community within our van store suffered too. We had deep reach into our communities. We were the largest, one of the largest taxpayers for the city of Warren, where we were headquartered, and one of the largest contributors to our food banks. When the company went under, there was a terrible ripple effect of harm felt throughout the state of Michigan. I'm here today to show you the human toll of Wall Street's greed. Our elected leaders, each of you here today, I have to ask you, excuse, <clears throat> excuse me, I have to ask you why billionaires should be allowed to do this and destroy the fiber of America. Why should this be legal? It should, this is a sin, it is unconscionable, and something needs to change. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak with you today. Ms. Smith, thank you very much for being with us today. We really appreciate it. Uh, and now we have in person, Ms. Peggy Malone, who is a registered nurse at the Crozier Chester Medical Center in Upland, Pennsylvania. Thank you, Senator Warren and members of the subcommittee. Um, I am the vice president of Crozier Chester Nurses Association. Uh, we're a local of uh, PASVAP and I am also on the executive board. I have been a registered nurse for 32 years at Crozier Chester Medical Center. 
Um, being a nurse for me and my colleagues is a calling. It, it is a profession that we are very proud of. And private equity has no business in healthcare. They have destroyed our hospital. They have destroyed the fiber of what we are as healthcare professionals. Prospect Medical Holdings, which has 17 hospitals across the country, the owners, I can go on and on about the owners, Leonard Green, um, David Top or Sam Lee and what they have done. That's all public knowledge. You can find that out. You can get that information. You can see that it's wrong that our tax system should not be creating incentives for business practices and private equity firms. They should not be able to extract, extract huge dividends from hospitals. They were dying. They had no family. They had no one in the rooms but us. It was the nurses. It was the respiratory therapists. It, we were the ones that had to go in. We were scrambling for iPads so that families could say goodbye to their loved ones without having anyone in the room. We were their families. We were using poor quality equipment. I would have to try to straddle a urinal to collect urine from a patient's bag between my feet with a gown and a mask and all the PPE. Number one, we were wearing trash bags at a certain point because we didn't even have enough PPE. And this is how we were taking care of patients day in and day out. I left my family. I stayed at a house that the local college gave us because I was afraid to take it home to my family. I had my children at home who were having graduations and everything taken away from them, as all of my colleagues. And we went in and we did this job every day to the best of our ability with no equipment, with no PPE. We were afraid for our lives and we did this job and we did it every day for every single person in this country. We thought we were doing good. And you know what? Now we're the bad guys because we're speaking up and we wanna know where that money is and we wanna know how these private equity firms cannot take care of the patients that are in these hospitals. We don't have enough staff. We don't have enough equipment. We are fighting every day Day to give good quality care to patients and we are not able to do it. We are not able to do it and nobody was in there watching. There were no families in there. There was no one watching. It was just us and we were watching people die. And so I can give you the statistics. I can talk about, I can talk about Leonard Green and I can talk about all the things that are going on and all the tax credits and things that these companies are given. They were given pandemic money and we have not seen one bit of it being spent on the patients. That is our goal. Private equity does not belong in healthcare. Our job is to do no harm. It is to do no harm, it's to care for our patients. That's why we got into this and we will fight and every nurse I know will fight. But what I see now, we're seeing the PTSD, we're seeing the nurses suffering, we're seeing the doctors struggle. What we saw was a war zone for the last 20 months and it's not over. And we have not gotten support. We have not gotten support from our administration. We have not gotten the supplies that we need. We do not have the staff that we need. Private equity has no business in healthcare. So thank you, Ms. Malone. Uh, and thank you for the work that you have done. I lost my brother early in the pandemic and he had no one with him except the nurses who showed up to, to hold his hand. Um, I appreciate all that you've done, and I know it's been hard. Uh, we now have our final witness, uh, and that is uh, Dr. Applebaum. Uh, Dr. Applebaum, could you please uh, talk with us a bit? Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Senator Warren, Senator Kennedy, members of the subcommittee. Uh, I'm very happy uh, to be here to testify today. Uh, private equity is a largely unregulated financial actor, and it is playing a growing role in both the uh, U.S. Uh, economy and in global economies. Uh, in 2020, global assets under management reached 4.5 trillion, and this is expected to double to 9 trillion by 2025. So it's a big and important player uh, in the U.S. Private equity owns or backs 8,000 companies uh, in every nook and cranny of the economy in industries ranging from healthcare, as we just heard, uh, to IT, to retail chains, uh, to supermarkets, single family rental homes, and payday lenders. They're, they're in every part of the economy. 
Uh, the private equity industry and its companies employ nearly 12 million workers. Pension funds and other limited partners have been uh, pouring money into private equity funds, seemingly unaware that it is really hard for any uh, private equity fund to beat a booming U.S. stock market, and uh, they have not beaten it. Uh, we find that the uh, research has shown that the median private equity fund in every vintage since 2006 has just tracked the stock market. It hasn't actually beaten it. Yet fundraising by the largest, by the largest private equity firms has reached stratospheric levels. It's not that investors in private equity don't see a return on their money. They do see it. However, the point is that they could have gotten the same return by investing in stock market index funds uh, without all the risk. Uh, so that the, 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 they're not beating the stock market is the point. You could have done as well in the stock market. Uh, the big uh, private equity funds are just raking in money from institutional investors. In the last five years, Blackstone and KKR each raised more than $90 billion. This year, KKR has launched, uh, an, it was launching an $18.5 billion, uh, billion for its North America fund, and Carlisle has announced plans to raise $27 billion for its next fund in what would be the biggest private equity fund. They, 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 it is not possible to take that kind of money invested in, they have just a few years to deploy it, uh, and uh, to invest it in small companies. They invest in really big companies, which uh, do not give you much opportunity for turning them around. We've just seen the $38 billion purchase of Medline, a family-owned company, by private equity firms. You don't pay $38 billion for a company you think you have to turn around. Um, with all that cash on hand, Private equity is poised to buy up large swaths of the U.S. economy with no limit on how much, uh, how much debt they can lever on the com company, with no limit on how much wealth they can take out, and no limit on how hard they can squeeze the, the employees. A study of uh, examining private equity buyouts of public companies uh, found that when private equity takes these public companies private, employment declines by 13% in just the first two years. Another study that looked at private equity buyouts that used a lot of debt found that the uh, bankruptcy rates uh, were as high as 20%. For affected workers, their families and communities, this is devastating. But win or lose, the private equity firms always walk away with a profit. Thank you. Okay, John. Well, I want to thank um, Chairman Warren and Ranking Member Kennedy for allowing me to go first and ask questions. Senator Warren will return promptly from the vote. Um, Dr. Applebaum, uh, what do you believe to be the primary gaps in the regulation and supervision of private equity? I think that there's little recognition that what were once just by leveraged by our firms have now really uh, developed many, many avenues uh, for making money and for participating in the economy. So it's not just leverage buyouts. Uh, it's also the credit funds, which I think uh, are playing a huge role uh, in a shadow economy. So the credit funds, it, so back in 2013, the regulators said to the banks, uh, really, you shouldn't put more debt on a company than six times earnings, because our research shows that when you go beyond that point, the company is very likely to default on its debts, to experience financial distress, and to even go bankrupt. So they put that out there. Uh, and KKR came along and it had difficulty raising the kind of money it wanted to put on uh, a, a company that it was buying. And so it wasn't long before the private equity firms figured out they needed their own credit funds. And these credit funds, they act like investment bankers, but there is no uh, banking uh, regulation of them. So I, I think that, that, that that's really a huge gap uh, in our knowledge of what's going on. Private equity now has real estate funds. 
these real estate investment funds move back and forth. Sometimes they're publicly traded, sometimes they're uh, privately held by the, by the, uh, uh, the uh, private equity firm. Uh, they are playing a, a role that I think is little understood in the economy. I, I've been studying healthcare, and so I've seen their role there. Uh, when, when you say that uh, uh, a chain like Stewart sold its real estate to a real estate investment trust, uh, that would be a company that, that, that would be something that moves back and forth without without much regulation and provides a lot of money to operators to go out and buy up in this case more hospitals so we've seen a buying spree of hospitals by private equity or formerly private equity owned uh, chains funded by the real estate investment trust so they're in many aspects of the economy we look to the SEC to say, well, you know, shouldn't you be taking a look at them? But in fact, uh, it's not just the SEC that needs to be involved. Uh, we have, we, we uh, regulate investment banks, and I think if uh, these credit funds want to operate as investment banks, they should be regulated in the same way. And I think we need to know a lot more about the role of real estate investment trusts in the economy. They fly completely below the radar uh, but they fund a lot of the expansion that we see going on uh, by private equity firms. Thank you very much, Dr. Appleman. Uh, now, uh, if the treasurer is still on WebEx or, or Zoom, uh, Treasurer Freebrix, uh, uh, I, I would like to ask if you could share your experience with private equity in terms of fee and expense arrangements, and uh, do you believe these arrangements are adequately disclosed and transparent? Okay, so my office experience is similar to what other institutional investors are recognizing. And that is, as private equity continues to evolve, there's a growing need for improved disclosures around direct and indirect fees, expenses, and performance-based <coughs> fees, such as carried interest in particular. It's safe to say that investors such as ourselves or public pension plans would be greatly benefited an increased level of disclosure and transparency between general partners of private equity firms and investors. Given that fees charged by private equity managers are among the highest shouldered by institutional investors, the lack of transparency represents a meaningful risk factor. It is necessary to ensure transparency for all investors and ensure investors can validate fees, but also understand if there are any potential conflicts of interest around certain fees that may be passed through to companies that may negatively affect our investments. Well, thank you very much, Treasurer, and uh, thank you for the panel. Uh, I would happily and uh, yield it back to my colleague from Louisiana, and I'm going to vote. Thank you, John. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Mr. Treasurer, I'm, I'm a little confused. Uh, as Treasurer, you invest in private equity, do you not? That is correct. And your concern, concern we should all share, is you say the fees are opaque and there's not enough transparency. Correct. Are you telling me that you make private equity investments as a fiduciary without understanding the fees? And if so, whose fault is that? Yeah. We put a lot of time and effort into understanding these fees and working, but that adds increased cost to us. And there are also smaller pension plans out there that don't have the resources. Well, why don't you just want, don't make the investment? Well, <clears throat> but oftentimes we don't if, if they're not willing to work with us. So what's the but problem? We, just as in other fields and other investment classes, the transparency has been helpful in bringing down the cost of fees and things like mutual funds. We think we'd see improvements in fees with greater transparency. But, but if, if I go to buy a car and the car salesman doesn't explain the details of the financing to me, I, I just walk away. I don't call for the federal government to take over every car salesman in America. What am I missing here? Well, I'd say I we're, mean, we're not calling is, on the federal this, government to. This is this is a th these are two uh, two players in the financial markets. You, you're not required to invest in private equity. 
In fact, you breach your fiduciary duty to invest in private equity if you don't understand the fees, don't you? As I said, we put a lot of effort and time into this. I'm the first one to note that we at the Illinois Treasury significantly increased our allocation to the private equity space, given the opportunities and our ability to manage risks. Well, have you have you ever We're invested in private equity private when you equity. didn't understand the fees? Never. I never said we didn't understand the fees. We are advocating for the elimination, not advocating for the elimination of private equity. We're seeking reforms to make it easier for us to do our jobs, to stop abuses, to increase transparency, to help create more efficient markets and provide basic protection. I understand. Have you ever invested in a private equity deal as a fiduciary, as a state treasurer, without understanding the fees? We, we put a lot of effort into this, but that results in increased costs as well. And just as we saw public I, I, I understand that. I heard you the first time. But have you ever invested in a private equity deal without understanding the fees? No. Okay. Let me ask. Uh, Dr. Holtzikin. I, I've looked at this legislation. It'll gut private equity like a fish. I think that's correct. Now, what will that impact have on, on workers of America? We know that, you know, the private equity markets are very large. Uh, as, as David Burton pointed out, that this is an important source of capital. Uh, capital is how firms invest in skills for their workers, technologies, equipment. Uh, it raises productivity and that productivity flows into higher real wages. So you're, uh, you're, you're really affecting the standard of living. Is it going to cause layoffs? Future. Absolutely. You get rid of private equity, whether you do it in a de facto or de jure way, you, can, you could abolish private equity. You could also regulate it half to death. No, regulate it completely to death. Mm -hmm. Now, if you, if you do that, I know it's in vogue to talk about rich billionaires around here, but they... They uh, comprise a very small part of the American free enterprise system. We're going to have massive layoffs, aren't we? Yes. I mean, you, you need the capital to run the economy. In fact, isn't that what free enterprise is? A marriage of capital and labor? Yes. Some of my colleagues think it's a zero-sum game. They think that the American economy is like it was back in, in, in uh, primitive times. Uh, to take a Marxist approach, some of my colleagues think that the only value in an economy is labor. And if you make money in an economy, you have to make money. If you become wealthy, you do it by exploiting labor. That's not an accurate description of the American economy today. Capital joins with labor. And today they both improve their value. That's how we, we grow our GDP, is it not? That's correct. All right, do you disagree with anything I said, Mr. Burton? No, and the one thing that you didn't really mention is it's not just capital and labor, it's also entrepreneurship and innovation, and it takes capital to, to uh, innovate, to acquire new technologies, and that's how productivity uh, improves, and that's how wages go up. If, if you don't become more productive through technological innovation or better management practices, then uh, you can't see wages go up over any extended period of time. Uh, I also think there's sort of, everything you said is absolutely true with respect to private capital markets. Uh, if, if we were to restrict private capital markets, we would destroy the United States economy because they're the most important means of raising capital for businesses and particularly for entrepreneurship. Uh, there's a, a more narrow case of, of these private equity funds that are basically engaged in acquiring failing public companies. Can I stop you? Because I'm yeah. way over time. Yep, yep, yep. yep. But, but since Senator Warren's right. coming back, do they have private, equi private equity in Cuba? No. Do they have private equity in Venezuela? No. If they have private equity in China, it's state-owned, right? Uh, China is a little bit more ambiguous, but they're certainly restricting private enterprise. 
Well, so is that um, where we're headed here to have government own, uh, run private equity like President Xi does in China? Yes. Would this bill move us toward that end? This bill would make private equity funds narrowly defined utterly uneconomic. Now, my understanding of private equity is that you have a company that goes out and says, we're really good at investing money. And we ask you to invest your money, private investor, with us, the private, uh, the, the venture capital company. And in order to invest in that venture capital company, you got to be an accredited investor. I mean, you got to have a net worth and show that you're an assist, sophisticated investor. Generally, yes. And then that private equity company goes and buys a private business. When it buys that private business, does it put a gun to the head of the owner of the private business and say you have to sell? No. So it's usually a voluntary transaction. Yes. And so now you've got a new owner of the business. Is that right? Yes. And that new owner tries to increase the value of that business because that new owner wants to make money. Am I right? Yes. Uh, does it always work? No. If it doesn't work, who loses? Uh, there can be a lot of losers. The right. shareholders, uh, the equity fund, employees, customers, vendors. But if it does work, it's a beautiful thing. Yes. And we call this free enterprise. Yes. As opposed to government saying you 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 can invest there, but you have to invest there. Right. Okay. I went way over. That's okay. But I had to stall. <laughs> Are you good? I'm done. All okay. right. I'm going to go vote. Thank you all for coming today. Teachers and firefighters are being asked to take money out of their retirements to pad the pockets of private equity billionaires, and they aren't even getting the above average market returns that they thought that they were paying for. Is that a fair it, summary? It is definitely a fair summary, and, and you have to remember uh, that these are risky investments. And the idea at the beginning was that they would get uh, a return that was 3% above the market to uh, reward them for the risk that they're taking. Okay. And now they're getting they get no premium whatsoever. Okay, so they're getting, they're getting no premium, but they're taking on more risk. Um, so we, had a we have a chance here now to talk with the treasurer of the number one state employee pension fund, the fund that is doing better than any other public employee pension fund. I mean, hurrah, right? This is not the one in the middle. This is the one way down on the top performing end. Treasurer Fravics, you have been doing very well with private equity. Is, is that a fair statement? Yes, that's correct. Good. And you are an investor. Uh, that is, you manage a pension fund on behalf of your office. You are a trustee for a public pension plan that invests in private equity on behalf of teachers and firefighters and other public employees. So the question I want to ask you as an investor, you're on the, you're on the side that's trying to make money out of this. Are you satisfied with the current rules governing private equity, or would you like to see some new rules in place requiring transparency about fees and aligning the interests of PE managers with their investors? Yeah, I'll just say that uh, PE has done well by us, but it would be beneficial to see new rules and sensible reforms. For example, standard reporting would ensure transparency for all investors and ensure investors can validate all fees charged by private equity so now that they conform with their negotiated agreements. That would be one good reform. Our office does its due diligence. Senator Kennedy asked if uh, I had made any uh, investments without that. No, we do our due diligence, but for us and many of our public fund peers, there is difficulty receiving proper disclosure and transparency around direct and indirect fees in a clear and consistent manner. There's been characterization that uh, we're heading towards uh, socialism here. I believe in the market here, and I believe markets work well and efficiently with proper access to information. This, this, this opaqueness makes it difficult to shop around and determine whether we're getting a competitive rate. 
No, he's right. Uh, if we're buying a car and someone wouldn't disclose to us, we wouldn't want to buy there. But sometimes they will just flood you in information and bury things in that sale document at that car dealer. You know, and we regulate car dealers to make sure there's proper disclosure. Without proper disclosures, tracking of fees and expenses charged by a private equity firm is a cumbersome process. And markets shouldn't be cumbersome. This can then potentially enable firms to hide and shift fees, potentially manipulate returns reporting, and avoid disclosing certain deals. Ultimately, I believe new rules would be valuable. Yeah. So as I understand this, you're saying you like the market, but it's very hard for you to be able to see what you're paying in fees. And if that's hard, that means it's very hard to make comparative judgments. And I just want to emphasize here, you're not one of the little funds. Am I right on this? You, you have a pretty big, pretty big shop there. Correct. We oversee tens of billions of dollars in investments and between ISBI and internal, um, billions of dollars in uh, private equity. So we have resources here, but still, in order to use those resources to try and sort through all this, it costs us extra money. And smaller pension funds don't have the resources that we have. Yeah, I think there's just a really important point about markets. If we want markets to work, then people have to have consistently reported information so you can get comparisons across them and the information has to be made available. You know, I appreciate your testimony on this. My, my Stop Wall Street Looting Act would require private equity funds to clearly disclose their fees and returns so that public pensions and other investors have the information that they need in order to make informed decisions. America faces a retirement crisis, but the solution is not to squeeze employees more or to cut retail jobs and wages or to undermine the health and safety of people in hospitals and nursing homes. The solution is to put stronger rules in place that investors and retirees and families don't get gouged by private equity firms that are trying to fleece them. So. To me, that's what this hearing is about today. Um, since I didn't get to do an opening statement at the beginning, I just want to do a, a kind of overview as we wrap this up and say thank you to everyone who has been here. You know, this is the first hearing that the Senate has held that is focused entirely on private equity. And it's about time that we do this. We need to get the facts on the table about what private equity firms are doing to our economy and to our communities. Private equity firms have plenty of money to spend on lobbyists and PR campaigns. They have their own trade association, which I know has been making the rounds in Congress ahead of this hearing. They have worked hard to portray themselves as good actors that bring jobs and investments to communities in need, and they have no problem telling their version of the story. But their version of the story glosses over a lot of what have plenty of money to spend on lobbyists and PR campaigns. They have their own trade association, which I know has been making the rounds in Congress ahead of this hearing. They have worked hard to portray themselves as good actors that bring jobs and investments to communities in need. And they have no problem telling their version of the story. But their version of the story glosses over a lot of what happens to local workers, to local businesses, to local communities when some private equity firm waltzes into town. Once private equity starts buying up local stores or hospitals or newspapers or prison commissaries or for-profit colleges or nursing homes or hospitals or any of dozens of other industries, the smiling private equity managers and their secret investors profit hugely while workers and local businesses and local communities too often come out as the losers. 
in 2019, I opened a broad investigation of the role of private equity in the economy. And this investigation exposed how the industry is fundamentally broken. Private equity relies on a business model that pays managers to go after short-term profits, charging huge fees even as they destroy the long-term prospects of the businesses that they buy. It is bad for workers and bad for consumers when local retailers or even large chains are bought out by private equity. These firms load up the target company with debt, as we've seen the examples here today. They strip out assets, and the next thing you know, thousands of workers have lost their jobs and the stores are shut down. It's also bad for seniors and their families when private equity firms buy up nursing homes and other health care providers. It's the same pattern. Assets are stripped out, cost cutting runs rampant, and the quality of care declines with real consequences for people's health and for their lives. It's bad for students when private equity firms buy up for-profit colleges. The industry already has a bad record of ripping off students and private equity just makes it worse. It is bad for communities when private equity firms buy up thousands of manufactured homes and the land that they sit on. Costs skyrocket, forcing residents to choose between paying the rent and paying for basic necessities like food and medicine. And meanwhile, the investments in these communities decline and conditions get worse and worse. And by the way, we will be hearing more about that particular abuse of private equity in the housing sector tomorrow at the Banking Committee hearing, and I'm looking forward to joining Senator Brown on that. Thanks for watching, and if you haven't already, please consider subscribing to our channel. And while you're at it, please leave us a comment. Thank you for watching.